last session, we, we talked about how inflammation is actually the main driver of the amyloid precursor protein that stimulates the excessive buildup of beta amyloid plaque. We're going to be learning that inflammation stimulates this process because the brain needs beta amyloid to protect itself against trauma. Therefore, we need to be careful about how we turn off inflammation. Because if we just find a switch or take a pill to just lower inflammation, we may be circumventing the very process that was designed into the brain to protect it from injury. So you see there's going to be a very delicate balance here. And we have to be very careful of how we read research and determine what a prudent, rational, potentially beneficial strategy would be. In other words, we need to have a pretty high bar for anything that we introduce as a therapy, especially for Alzheimer's, but because we're talking here about protection to the brain. And you'll find this session very interesting for that reason. So we ended last session talking about how inflammation was critical and how just looking, for instance, at a standard lipid profile, profile uh, total cholesterol, total L LDL cholesterol, the HDL good cholesterol, the triglycerides, the actual blood flat, a fat flowing through our bloodstream. The, that lipid profile is extremely beneficial. It's very useful, but it doesn't pick up about 60% of patients at risk of a heart attack, meaning it's extremely insensitive. Beneficial, but just not adequate. Nowhere near adequate enough is the point. And that's very much like the same concept that we've been addressing earlier about somebody saying, I'm a wellness you know, uh, guru, and I'm all into fitness, and that's my wellness program, fitness. As important as that is, and I'm not knocking that, I'm a, you know, I, I, my original degree was in physical education. You know, I, I'm very passionate about fitness. You learned in the first session that I need to get going and get a little fitter now, right? Okay, and so I'm going to use that as a good motivation. I'm not going to be upset at the doctor for telling me I need to work out more. I'm going to thank him for giving me a reason to wake up and do what I should have been doing all along, to be fitter. Not just an athlete, but actually to be a fit athlete, right? Um, and so... And so we can't just look at one strategy and expect it's going to work. Likewise, we can't just do one basic uh, lab test, an important one, a lipid profile, and think just because it's good that we're okay. So we learned that, that the two potentially most valuable measures of inflammation are... Oh, I'm going backwards. Okay. <laughs> the two most important measures of inflammation are actually the plaque test, the phospholipase A2 enzyme test in the blood, which measures how much, how much uh, potential plaque buildup you have in your artery wall, and therefore a direct measure of inflammation in your arteries and risk of clotting, strokes, and heart attacks. And the cardiac CRP, high sensitivity CRP test that measures inflammation everywhere. By the way, that test could be high for almost any reason. If you have a cold, that test is going to be sky high. If you, like me, injured your calf muscle uh, quite badly and there's inflammation, that will show up on this cardiac CRP test. If, if you have cancer, that oftentimes will show a very high cardiac CRP. If you... Um, if you have gum infections, sinus infections, uh, bacterial infections in the stomach, H. pylori, if you have fun, any kind of infection, anything that draw any injury, any trauma, it's going to increase that number. 
And so when you see a high cardiac CRP, you now need to ask why. Okay, it's, in, it says high. Why? Which now means you need to get, you need to zero in on the cause. You gotta do a little medical detective work. I, I've heard from, from uh, uh, various conferences, a lot, of, a lot of docs don't think it's a valuable test because it's non-specific. Yeah, but it's still showing there's risk. So now it's basically a call to action that we got to figure out what that risk is, which means we got to do a little bit more work. So inflammation drives the production of beta amyloid plaque potentially excessively forming into, into uh, plaque clumps throughout in between brain cells, interfering with brain signaling and communication and memory. But then that leads to tangles in the brain. In October of 2015, I was, I was um, driving to lunch, actually, a soup plantation to get my greens and my colorful veggies. And, um, and I'm listening to the news at the top of the hour about this massive scaffolding collapse in Houston, Texas. How many of you remember hearing about that on the news? Yeah, quite a few of you. And, and so here's a newspaper account of... Fortunately, nobody died. This is scaffolding that went up, I think, seven stories across the whole city block. It all collapsed. No one died. Wow. But, but to, to see this, this massive collapse of the scaffolding, you know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of Alzheimer's disease. Because what happens when, when, when this, this body's attempt to protect itself to protect the, the brain goes awry and the body's no longer able to clean up that immunologic battle, the mess that accumulates because of the immunologic battle, that's when the nerves start suffering. This is just like the rest of the body. If you get an infection, if you get an infection in your leg and it's deep in your leg, let's say it's a puncture wound, and it'll get red, it'll get inflamed, it'll get swollen, it'll get pussy. Why? Because the immune system is attacking that infection. And white blood cells are literally sacrificing their very lives to protect you. And, and hundreds of thousands of these immune cells are, are literally dying because they've, they've engulfed so much infective material that they can no longer survive. And that's what pus is. Pus is dead immune cells full of infectious or toxic material. And I'd like to suggest to you that that's exactly what the beta amyloid plaques are. In part, that they're, they're, in a, they're basically an attempt of the immune system to fight the good fight. But if that pus in your leg isn't that abscess isn't able to work its way out to the surface and be released, what's going to happen? If it doesn't get released naturally, you better go to your doctor and you better have that doctor do whatever they do to lance that or, or, or drain that properly because if that doesn't drain, if that doesn't get out, you're going to die. You're going to become septicemic and you will die. I'd like to suggest to you that that's exactly what's going on in the brain. In a different way, okay, is that the, all that, that Im immunologic battle, the debris of that, of that attempt to protect you is not being cleared away properly. And there's some very, very powerful reasons for that. And one of them is that we simply don't sleep enough. Now, this isn't just something that I made up. There are literally hundreds of studies documenting this. And, I'd, I'd actually, and we're going to talk about it more in a little bit, but I just want to say for, right now, this is so critical, that unless we figure out how to optimize sleep, all bets are off. This is such an important issue that, that based on the data I've reviewed, it suggests to me that without optimal sleep, you really are essentially hamstringing yourself in your ability to reverse cognitive decline 
or to prevent Alzheimer's. That's how critical this is. Okay, now, don't go into despair and discouragement. Because I, I know what some of you are thinking right now. He says, are you kidding me? I may as well get up and go home right now. Because I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and, and I can't sleep. And, and what I'm suggesting to you, don't give up. I'm not, I'm not even saying that. I'm certainly not saying it's going to be easy to figure this out. I'm saying we should never give up in trying to figure out what is driving that. Now, fortunately, a lot of the strategies that are actually good for the brain also are good to help us sleep better. Okay, and we'll, we'll go over those things, and just real quickly right now is, is make sure you, you, you uh, get up early, early enough in the morning to get outside for at least half an hour in the, in the morning light, or if you can't do it first thing in the morning, at lunchtime. So I, I'm really bad at this myself, and so I'm trying to remember, after I eat lunch, get outside. See, I play basketball inside. I wish I had a basketball court nearby that was outside. I don't. It's all inside. But going outside at any time during the day, at least for a half an hour, really good for sleep. Powerful for inducing sleep. See that bright light, being outside in bright light, actually helps you, helps the pineal gland of the brain produce a lot more melatonin when you do go to sleep at night. And, and you can actually potentially produce an additional 50% or more melatonin than you otherwise would simply because you were outside in the bright light that day. And because you chose to go to bed at a reasonable hour. Now, this is another challenge that I have. Now, I'm doing this series not just for you, it's for me too, right? I need to learn how to apply these principles to my life as well. And the bottom line is this, is that the, essentially, the two hours before midnight, based on the circadian rhythm of the body, will help us generate a lot more melatonin than any hour that we sleep after midnight. Now, there's some people on the Internet that try to refute that. That's okay. You know, we're all chair, chairmen or chairwomen of our own health. So but see, you got to look at what the evidence is. And the bottom line is your body produces more melatonin when you go to bed earlier and get up earlier. So this notion that as long as you get seven hours or eight hours of sleep, you can do it any time of the day or night isn't really true. And I know that some of you are going to have that question, what about night shift workers? We'll deal with that later. The bottom line is that you have to have a plan and you need to follow that plan. Because when we don't have a plan or we don't follow our plan, we tend to go to bed later and later and we just think, well, we follow our feelings. And, it, and this is the key thing. You know, you remember that Sprite commercial? Follow your feelings. Basketball guys, right? Follow your feelings. And I, I just kept shaking my head. I said, that's like the worst advice anybody could ever follow to follow their feelings. Following our feelings, we're basically, uh, you know, whatever you feel like doing, do that. that that's, that's a guarantee to get into trouble, right? Just ask your spouse. <laughs> ask anybody. Following our feelings, following our heart. Bad, bad idea. We need to, we need to develop a plan and follow that plan. Follow the plan, uh, develop a plan when we're being rational, when we're thinking what's really best for me. I used to, when I was a teenager, I was reading some great books and reading the book Ministry of Healing, and it was inspired me, and I, I came up with this little, little saying, it says, do today what tomorrow you would have wished you had done today, which basically means follow your plan. Tomorrow you wake up and go, oh, man, I wish I would have done that yesterday. Didn't follow my plan, so now I'm behind today. So, so sleep is critical. To, to help, and I'll give you a little preview, during deep sleep is the only time your brain can detoxify. The only time. During deep sleep, the, the brain has its own detoxification system called the glymphatic system. 
the glymphatic system basically opens up its channels at night, and it does so by the brain literally contracting and opening up these channels of cerebral uh, spinal fluid to flush through the brain crevices and literally wash away toxins that have been generated during the day's activities. The brain literally uses more energy than any part of the body. Uh, uh, essentially 25% of all the glucose, of all the carbohydrates stored in the body get used by the brain. We think of the brain as just being this this, 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 uh, this uh, you know, butter just sitting there, you know, quivering. The brain is the most active organ of the body. And, and so it needs to detoxify. It has to be defragged every night. It has to be cleaned out, flushed out every night. And you know that, and I would never have believed this if it hadn't been Dr. Rudy Tanzi who said it himself. He says, when you sleep, in deep sleep, your brain literally squeezes out beta amyloid plaque. <laughs> wow. It squeezes it out, and the cerebral spinal fluid flushes it out. Now, what's interesting is that studies after studies have shown, and they, they actually do cerebral spinal fluid punctures. They, they, they test that in Europe. All the time, it's just a common test. We don't do that much in the United States. Not sure why. Um, yeah, it seems to be maybe a little barbaric, <laughs> but but they, that's one of the workups that their neurologists use in Europe, and maybe certain teaching hospitals to evaluate the risk for Alzheimer's. Because the more, essentially, the more beta amyloid plaque you see in the cerebral spinal fluid in the uh, spinal column, essentially, that that uh, higher amount of beta amyloid plaque means that you have less in your brain. That means you're actually flushing it out. And then the body's processing that other way. Interesting. Okay? So if you don't have deep sleep and regular sleep and consistent sleep, what does that say about our risk of, develop, of not being able to clean that, an, uh, that analogy, in this case, of that abscess? in our thigh that, that is at risk of causing septic contamination to the rest of the body and death, right? So we got to detoxify properly. And if we're not doing what is necessary, then naturally we're going to be suffering those consequences. So this scaffolding collapse happened when one car bumped into the corner, crashed into the corner of that scaffolding, and the whole thing came down. This spread, this spread of a misfolding of proteins through the beta amyloid plaque and what's called the tau proteins, which are actually the protein structural tubules inside the nerve cells in the brain. Those structural tubules, the scaffolding of the inner part of the brain nerves, literally disintegrate in Alzheimer's thus essentially rendering that nerve cell useless for communicating information back and forth. And at that point, the body and the immune system has no choice but to kill that, kill that nerve cell in the brain because it's no longer functional. That's all part of this innate immune system in the brain. The body's trying to basically prune the brain, get rid of the bad stuff, and then try to heal as much as possible. But we need to give it that potential. Okay, in comes Dr. Robert Moyer, a good friend of Dr. Tanzi, Rudy Tanzi. Both of them working at Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, I love this guy. He's Australian. I love the way Australians speak. Would you like a serviette? I've been to Australia with my family, and, and I love the way they talk. But he was so excited to present at this Cure Alzheimer's Fund symposium that beta amyloid is actually the good guy. He's been doing 20 years of research on this, and he jokes about it because everybody says, you know, 
uh, a beta bad, a beta bad, a beta bad, because that's what scientists call beta amyloid. They call it a beta or amyloid beta. You know, the rest of us talk normally and we call it beta amyloid, <laughs> right? And so essentially, Dr. Robert Moore and his research over the last 20 years has essentially proven over and over again that if you reduce the uh, capacity of the brain to make beta amyloid, you're potentially placing you at risk for a raging infection in your brain. And we could spend an hour on this all by itself, but we won't. And I'll tell you one thing that he said. He said that there was a major research study in, in Ireland some years back with a bunch of brilliant scientists who actually came up with a vaccine against beta amyloid. And it worked. And you know what happened? How come you've never heard about this? Because those human subjects that had this build up a beta amyloid plaque prior to vaccine and after the vaccine, those PET scans showed that that beta amyloid was gone. It was gone. Why'd they stop that, stop that study? Because these human subjects started developing meningitis. Why? Because the brain needs beta amyloid. That's why it's there. That's why God put it there. And that's why we have genes to activate it properly. We as guardians of our genome, we need to master it. We need to balance it. We need to ask the question, why? Why is that gene overproducing beta amyloid, and what can we do to balance that out? And that's, why, that's where we get into this whole realm, this critical issue of controlling infections in our body. I'd like to suggest to you that one of the main causes of type 2 diabetes, of heart disease, of cancer, and Alzheimer's disease has to do with infections in the body. I'm not talking about raging infections that cause your white blood cell count to go sky high and a fever to be obvious and you rush to the doctor and you get treated. If it was, then we'd get treated and it wouldn't be an issue, right? These are insidious, chronic, decades-long forms of low-grade infections that, in my thinking, can only be properly addressed if we take this larger view of comprehensive, network-based, systems-based lifestyle medicine. Because it's only through that approach that our immune system can be molded and shaped and optimized to the point where it actually can effectively fight the fight and not allow the body, and in this case the brain, to be constantly exposed to chronic low-grade infections or repeated over and over infections. You know, those of you that struggle with urinary tract infections or or, or any type of chronic recurring sinus infection or, or gum infections. You know what I'm talking about. It's, uh, it's miserable. I'm saying that this has to be dealt with in aggressively. We, we need to figure out how to do that. And the answer isn't just taking more antibiotics because any doctor will tell you in any medical journal that you look up will tell you that we're overprescribing those already, and we're getting all this, this uh, resistant bacteria developing and pretty soon. We're not going to be able to treat anything that's bacterial, certainly not the hardcore ones. So, so what do we do? And this is the age-old discussion about what's more important. Is the germ most important, or is it the soil? Is it the, the, the host, the human body? Right? And I'd like to suggest to you that fortifying the body's ability to effectively win the battle as quickly as possible over these low-grade infections and fully control them 
is ultimately a critical step in understanding this fight against Alzheimer's risk. That is the contribution that Dr. Robert Moyer brought to the forefront of my mind. And, and there, it, watch the video. Watch the YouTube video where, where Dr. Tanzi and others and Dr. Moore are talking about this. It's fascinating. Fascinating. So take, take advantage of that. Now, as soon as I learned about how critical this was, I said, wait a minute. Wait. In fact, he actually used the term, right, that we've been talking about all along. He says, Alzheimer's is really type 3 diabetes. Alzheimer's is diabetes of the brain. Alzheimer's is insulin resistance of the brain. Meaning that if we don't effectively reverse insulin resistance, we're sitting ducks. And guess what? My estimate, based on my experience and my, research, my, and my reading, suggests that at least 80% of adults have a clinically relevant level of insulin resistance. Meaning that the pancreas has to make a lot more insulin in order to try to control blood sugars. Meaning that diabetes is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to blood sugar issues or insulin resistance Likewise, Alzheimer's diagnosed is only the tip of the iceberg of the cognitive dementia that lies underneath. I'd like to suggest to you that all of us, including me, are at risk of insulin resistance because of our busy, crazy lifestyles where we're not really optimizing all the factors that control effectively insulin resistance. Dr. Robert Moore actually went on to say that type 2 diabetes, type 2 diabetes is actually Alzheimer's of the pancreas. And the first thought I had is like, whoa, wait a minute here. You're going to like, you're really getting off on, you know, left field on this. But rather than criticizing him, I decided to look it up. Right? And so... If, you, if something doesn't sit well with you, if something doesn't make sense to you, don't reject it just because it doesn't make sense to you, right? I can't reject it because, you know, that would suggest that I know, you know, 99% of the medical knowledge out there. And I certainly don't. I learn something new every day and I kick myself and say, I can't believe I, I've been studying for 35 years and I didn't know that. Right? And so we have to be open-minded enough to at least check the facts. And so I look it up and instantly hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies just come out. And I'm going like, where have I been for the last 20 years? How come I never saw this before? And so essentially there's study after study showing that type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, even pre-diabetes, is actually an amyloid disease just like Alzheimer's. Now, let me put this into perspective. You can see in Alzheimer's, the, the tip of that cognitive iceberg, the only part that we see of the problem oftentimes, okay, that, that, that represents a, a significant level of insulin resistance. And if we... If, and it's a very small number compared to the number of people who have diabetes, right? So there's 5.4 million people right now who have Alzheimer's disease in the United States. There is right now a minimum of 40 million people in the United States who have type 2 diabetes. And there's probably over 150. 150 million or more, because for every one diabetic, there's about three to four pre-diabetics. So we're talking about over 150 million people. It's, it's probably 200, 200 million to have pre-diabetes. Why? Because we know the statistics say that if you're over 40 
actually between the ages of 40 and 59, I'm just getting to the upper end of that, so I'm paying attention to that, one out of two of us already has at least prediabetes. Okay, that means that it's expected and statistically normal and average for you to be pre-diabetic. But that condition, which is so common, and essentially over 50% of us as adults have it, is actually the number one non-quote genetic mutation contributor to Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so prediabetes, diabetes, number one contributor, and I'll show you the researcher who said that in a minute, besides those who have a high genetic risk because of key Alzheimer's genes that are mutated. So, so from a strategic standpoint, what is the first thing that we should be focusing on? The first thing that we should be focused on is doing everything in our power to reverse insulin resistance, to reverse prediabetes, and reverse type 2 diabetes if at all possible, but more importantly, to get it all under control as much as possible. So, so critical. And that's why I've, I've dedicated the, the majority of my professional career to helping people deal with that tip of the iceberg. Insulin resistance. You know, my book is called Goodbye Diabetes. And the reason that Dan Houghton and I, you know, we were trying to figure out what, what to call this book. And I really wanted to call it, you know, Goodbye Insulin Resistance. But we knew that if we called it that, nobody would buy it. Because, <laughs> like, just, why is this guy resistant all the time? You know, why is he some activist? You know, I mean, they, nobody would have understood <laughs> but essentially, that's what the book is about, which means it's the number one strategic, comprehensive strategic approach to not just reverse diabetes and prediabetes and, and metabolic syndrome, but also infertility. Also, number one cause of infertility, insulin resistance. Number one cause of headaches, big time, uh, insulin resistance. Uh, someday we're going to learn, I believe, even though the data currently isn't there, that probably one, the, one of the, if not the biggest metabolic contributor to cancer, besides toxins and things like that, is insulin resistance. Why? We, we know that people who produce extra insulin to control blood sugar levels have a much higher risk of cancer. Those studies have been done for over 40 years. I've seen them. I've read them. Over 40 years, and it's hardly ever discussed. In other words, the number one way that you can lower your risk for cancer, even if you currently have cancer, and, and therefore helping your body deal with that more effectively, is reverse insulin resistance. Get your body working the way it was intended and designed to work. And so, so now, we're now we're learning that the pancreas is suffering the same condition as the Alzheimer's brain is suffering but it's happening exponentially at higher levels than in Alzheimer's. The beauty of this is the very same strategies that help one help the other because it's fundamentally the same process. So why, did the, why is the brain making beta amyloid? Because it's trying to protect itself. Okay, that's, that's the, the, the best we can do right now is we put all the, the research together because it's trying to protect itself. Yeah, there's, there's a chance that there's some crazy switch that got turned on for some reason and the, the process is just going out of whack. But really, most likely, there's all saying that if you hear hoofbeats coming up over the hill, it's probably horses. It's probably not rhinos, you know, probably not elephants. Even though you can't see them, it's probably horses. That's the most likely scenario that we see right now. So why would there be amyloid plaques forming in the pancreas? Because of low-grade infections. 
That's what amyloid is for. It's part of the innate immune system that's trying to protect that organ system. So, you know, uh, inadvertently, well, we did it on purpose, but we didn't know two, three years ago, writing the book Goodbye Diabetes, that type 2 diabetes was an amyloid disease. I didn't know that. Even though it was all through the literature, I didn't know that. Hardly anybody knows that. And so, but I still had a chapter in the book on fighting hidden culprits, which is what? Toxins and low-grade infection. Because that's clearly associated with diabetes. The, the, uh, the National Institutes of Health and the, the NHANES study, the, uh, that they, 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 every 10 years they do studies on massive um, uh, populations within the United States, and they found that the, the amount of toxins in your blood correlates far better with your risk for diabetes than weight ever did. In fact, if you don't have measurable levels of toxins in your blood, there's no association between weight and type 2 diabetes, suggesting that maybe it's the toxins that are creating a metabolic dysfunction that is causing the diabetes and the amyloid plaques such as scenarios and the weight gain. So the answer isn't to focus on the weight. The answer is to focus on the cause of the problem, and then everything gets better. Does that make sense? So, so we, need to, we need to pay attention to this, which ultimately means we need to boost and optimize immune function throughout the whole body. And that becomes a key strategy individually from a public health standpoint and certainly should be a major emphasis clinically. Unless we're doing everything possible to optimize the immune system naturally, we may not be getting to that tipping point, a tipping point necessary to accomplish that. So this is the book Goodbye Diabetes. Uh, it's available on dryoungberg.com. It's a comprehensive strategy to reverse insulin resistance. I believe that the number one step in protecting the brain is to deal with insulin resistance. Get the body working, get the metabolism working the way it should. Um, by the way, I also, uh, there's actually more and more research, especially in functional medicine, that says that the first thing you do with autoimmune disease is fix insulin resistance. In the end, it should be the first thing we do anyways because it's good for us because it's necessary to optimize health. Um, just, just in the last few weeks, in, in uh, April, uh, or late April of 2016, this program, Diabetes Undone, is now available. It's, it's a, a program that involves 40 videos, 10 to 15 minutes long each, uh, that, that were filmed of me addressing specific issues and organized in a way to help people accomplish that goal. And it's all available online. Go to diabetesundone.com and you can take advantage of that. Let me share with you right now one of those key strategies. Up until just a few, well, this past year actually, in the last few years, there was no research to back this up that I was aware of at least. But when I started working with diabetic and pre-diabetic and insulin resistant patients uh, back, back in 1990 at the Loma Linda Faculty Medical Group in Sun City, California, uh, you know, retirement community, so I was seeing a lot of diabetics and I had the privilege to work with the director of the Loma Linda University Diabetes Center, Dr. Charles Brenniger, and he was my mentor and, and kind of helped me understand that process better. And I started seeing what worked in treating type 2 diabetes, and type 1 diabetes for that matter, and gestational diabetes, uh, diabetes induced during pregnancy. And, and then as we started doing groups when I went to Guam in 1994, and, and we started checking blood sugars before and one hour after the beginning of the meal, and again, two hours after the beginning of the meal, we discovered something fascinating. That, uh, and, and by the way, if you have diabetes, this is what I would recommend that you do. 
take advantage of the book, take advantage of the course, and then for three days before you change anything, make sure you have a working, up-to-date blood sugar testing device and start checking your blood sugar before every meal and one hour after breakfast, two hours after breakfast, and the same after lunch and dinner. And then don't keep a huge detailed journal. Just write a few words about what you ate at each meal. And don't change anything. Just continue to eat the way you've always eaten over the last few months. And then track how your blood sugars go up and down during those three days. That'll give you a bird's eye view of what's going on with your blood sugar. Okay? Don't, change, just don't change anything. Just, just This is what your norm is. And you'll start to see how well, because most people, the vast majority of people with diabetes never check their blood sugars after a meal. And I would suggest to you that's probably the biggest mistake in, in treatment and management of, of diabetes, not of any kind of diabetes, not checking your blood sugars after a meal. Because that's by far the most important determinant of what's happening to your body and how much insulin now your pancreas has to make. It's your blood sugar spike immediately after the meal that determines how much insulin you need to produce or how much insulin you need to inject. And even uh, there's, there's, a, there's many type 1 diabetics that are injecting far more insulin than they should have to. Why? Because they are, for all intents and purposes, not only a type 1 diabetic, but they're also, in not all cases, but many cases, also a type 2 diabetic. Now, that's my words. Let me explain what I mean by that. Type 2 diabetes is an insulin-resistant state. Okay, it's where, it's where the muscles in the liver basically don't, don't want to take in more sugar. Okay, and, and even though you have lots of insulin floating around in your bloodstream, the liver and the muscles are resistant to taking in more sugar. That's what insulin resistance is, is the, the, the body is resistant to letting insulin store that sugar from the blood into the cell. It's kind of like having, having a, a lot of traffic during rush hour on the 15 freeway and all of a sudden, Homeland Security says, we're going to shut all the exits. Where are the cars going to go? The, all the, the on exits are working, but the off exits are not working. So in this analogy, sugar is coming into the blood, but very little sugar is coming out of the blood because the exits are blocked. And in this case, the ability of sugar to be taken into the cell where it must be to give us energy and stimulate neurotransmitter uh, production and do everything that constitutes life. Sugar does us no good absolutely at all in the bloodstream. It has to be in the cell to do us any good at all. And so when the blood sugar is high, that means it's not getting into the cell. Okay? So in, in, type two, in, in type 1 diabetes, if they also have the same lifestyle as everybody else that causes type 2 diabetes eventually, then they're going to have that same problem too. We never call it type 2 diabetes because they have type 1 diabetes, but essentially they have both. And that's why they need so much more insulin. Plus or minus, a type 1 diabetic should not ever need ideally more than 20, 30 units a day. If they need more than that, then there's resistance somewhere. Okay, so we need the goal. We need to figure out why and fix that. Uh, so there's an excited. Well, so you do that for three days, and then the only thing you change is walking or doing some type of light physical exercise immediately after the meal. And the reason I'm bringing this up now is this is literally one of the biggest, most effective and powerful strategies to reversing the main cause of Alzheimer's, which is 
blood sugar imbalances followed by insulin imbalances followed by blood sugar crashes that are loved to kill off brain cells. When your blood sugars crash, your brain crashes, just like that computer, that live stream computer crashed earlier. It's like it just didn't have what it, it didn't have what it took and it just crashed. That's what happens to the brain when the blood sugars drop too low. Those memory cells just literally implode. You gotta have glucose in the right amount in your cells or the, or the brain cells will die or they'll get really injured. And it's those injuries that lead over time, contribute, I should say, to Alzheimer's or some form of dementia. So um, start doing 5, 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes of light to moderate, just walking. You know, actually, make it your time. Do something fun. Just go out and smell the roses a little bit. Just enjoy that walking. And if you can't walk because your ankles are damaged, your knees are damaged, your hips are damaged, your back is damaged, find what works. Because an excuse is only going to hurt you, right? Nobody has an excuse not to exercise. Find something, even if this is all you can do, do that. Okay? And most people can do this. Just raise your hand, right? Just have a little fun, you know. Just enjoy, just do, do a little, act. that right there gets your blood flowing and it'll, and it'll bring your blood sugars down. Now, so these studies are being published, 15 minute walks after meals, uh, are, uh, and, and other studies showing that walks after meals are actually more effective than exercising before the meal. Is there a time that's more valuable is there an exercise time that's more valuable than other times? Well, let me put it this way. Any time of exercise is better than no exercise. Okay, so I want to be clear about that. So exercise when you can, when you can absolutely. But understand this point. If the problem with insulin resistance has to do with the blood sugar spiking after the meal, and if your blood sugars typically will peak at their high point roughly around one hour after the beginning of the meal, for some people it's half an hour, for some people it's one hour, for some people it's two hours. But here's the point. If you wait an hour to go do your light walk, as good as that is for you, what just happened? you in no way impacted that blood sugar spike after that meal, other than over time generating some level of fitness. But essentially, that blood sugar has already peaked to its high point, which means the amount of insulin that your pancreas has to produce to try to compensate for that has already been maxed out. And so you have lost already your opportunity to impact that level of insulin resistance at that point of your day. And it is that that is actually driving your risk for not just Alzheimer's over time, but cardiovascular disease, cancer, high blood pressure, and many other conditions, at least in significant part. So we're getting back to our exposome. And it's important to understand all the factors that contribute to this. Now, let me finish explaining to you, if you're a type 2 diabetic, if you're actually monitoring your blood sugars, after three days of just checking without any changes, then you do three days of just adding exercise after the meal. And you'll be amazed. You'll be amazed because now you have a true picture of where you were based on a normal schedule based on normal diet. And now you're going to have a true picture of simply adding one thing, only changing one thing, and that is after a meal, light to moderate activity. And this is a type of exercise that everybody can be involved in. You know, even the quadriplegic can still maybe, you know, exercise in some way or get a muscle stimulators hooked up. Yeah, I mean, figure it out. Somehow you want to do that. 
to get the benefit. And, and you will see, and this is what we've learned over many years of, of testing every patient before and after every meal with or without exercise. Light exercise after a meal will lower your blood sugars, your after meal blood sugars, anywhere from one to three points for every minute that you exercise. Remember, I'm not talking about get sweaty exercise. I'm talking about just, ah, this, you know, get the body moving. And so if you have diabetes, which presumably you would if you're checking your blood sugars, um, or pre-diabetes maybe, uh, you're, and your blood sugars typically one and two hours after the meal go above 200, which is so common, it's normal. Certainly not healthy, but it's extremely common. You could theoretically lower your blood sugars by 50, 60 points by going out for a walk. Just that could lower your blood sugars tremendously and then remove that burden of excess insulin in a dramatic way. After you've done that for three days, then you add in an optimal diet, a plant-based diet. You use... Karen Houghton's Naturally Gourmet. You know, figure out her, her cookbook. Figure out how to, to change your diet and use a balanced approach to optimize your health. A brand new cookbook just came out, Plant to Plate, Diabetes Edition. That is actually part of the Diabetes Undone program. Actually, in fact, <laughs> I, I was heavily involved in that, obviously, and so I insisted that that cookbook be so relevant to people with diabetes that even people who never cooked at all would use it every day. See, because not all of us are gourmet cooks. Not all of us are like Karen Houghton, <laughs> right, who can just make anything taste awesome. Hey, I'm kind of a... You know, I, I just don't know how to cook at all. <laughs> and, uh, and I just want to make sure, you know what I do for lunch a lot? I have a stash of organic lentils and organic beans, black bean soups in my office. I just, my wife does this for me because I don't do it for myself. And she gives, just gives me a whole bunch of different colorful greens and, 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 and uh, greens and all kinds of colorful vegetables and I have that after playing basketball and then I just eat a whole can of organic black bean soup or something like that. Beans, by the way, are the single most powerful food, any kind of beans, beans, peas, lentils, any, are the single most powerful food to, to reverse insulin resistance. Having legumes of any kind in a meal tonight will lower your blood sugars dramatically after that meal compared to not eating beans. Even though beans are a big source of carbohydrates and starch, they are so loaded with fiber and so loaded with anti-inflammatory magnesium and and hundreds and hundreds of other nutrients that provide anti-inflammatory effects, and they're so loaded with healthy plant-based protein that they will stabilize your blood sugars after that meal better than anything. Take advantage of legumes. And if you struggle digestively with legumes, fix your digestion. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that everybody has to eat legumes. You know, we're all different. I'm suggesting that the vast majority of us should be able to get to the point by fixing digestion, which is critical to health and critical to the brain. We'll talk about this some other time. But without optimal digestion, I don't believe your brain can be optimally healthy. It's not just an inconvenience and an embarrassment. It's critical for immune system health and critical for every aspect of health, especially the brain. 
you, you can't fix something without the right nutrients, and you're not going to have the right nutrients if you're not digesting properly. So fix that. So, but those, that, that serving of beans tonight with dinner will not only lower your blood sugars after dinner, but it will give you a lower blood sugar after breakfast tomorrow and after lunch tomorrow and after dinner tomorrow. So it improves your blood sugar control and your insulin sensitivity and therefore lowers your insulin resistance, not just for the next few hours, but really for the next 24 hours or so. But you don't stop there. You also have some legumes for lunch with your salad. And you see that snowballing in the right direction where your body's getting more and more sensitive to insulin. So now you're not having to produce all this extra insulin. So this is really critical. In the next session, we're going to be telling you that the amount of insulin you produce inversely determines how well you get rid of beta amyloid plaque that's out of control. In other words, if your body is constantly having to produce more insulin to control blood sugars, or at least try to, that extra insulin actually interferes directly with your brain's ability to remove beta amyloid plaque that has gone wild. This is critical. In fact, I'm going to give you a little tidbit of what's coming. There's an enzyme called insulin degrading enzyme, IDE, that's everywhere in the body, including the brain. And you got to look this up because I wouldn't believe it unless I looked it up. <laughs> You're going to find out when you look it up that this is the very same enzyme that breaks down beta amyloid plaque. So the body's approach to breaking down beta amyloid plaque is determined by the amount of insulin it has to break down. And we'll talk about that in the next session.